revolutionary approach to fix national problem for Thai people. Let me give you some idea on how this happened. On the day that I went to invite Kun Bantun at Gasikon Bank to talk about the transition of the banking sector, Kun Bantun graciously suggests that it's so boring. <laughs> Let's talk about something that revolutionize the way that people would do the business. And he suggests that let's talk about sustainable development. And non project is one of the initiative that we would like to give a brief to you today. Kun Bantun Lamsam has served as a chief executive officer of Kasikon Bank since 2004 and chairman of the board since 2013. Currently, he also served as a director of Poo Car Trade. Puka Farm, or Puka, Puka Realty, Puka Go, Puka Nanfa Hotel, and Santi Cassette Company. All of these companies involved with the social enterprise and sustainable development. At the moment, Kun Bantun is also the member of the National Tourism Policy Committee, the National Strategy Committee, the State Enterprise Policy Commission, the National Reform Subcommittee, on state administration and the Reform Steering Committee on Thailand 4.0 policy. Mr. Mantun holds a bachelor degree in chemical engineering from Princeton University and a master degree in business administration from Harvard Business School. Please join me to welcome Mr. Mantun on the stage, please. การเดินในการแข่งขันโดยปกติเราต้องเดินอยู่ประมาณ 28 much for having me here. Thank you, Kun for introduction. That clip used no computer graphic. That was shot real. It uh, was made uh, over a month ago. And for those among us who are golfers, that is the biggest sand trap we will ever have to face. Kun <laughs> uh, uh, uh came and invited me to, to give a talk, and I said, I don't do banking work anymore. Uh, I do something else more interesting. The, um, so Nan province, uh, I guess uh, for those of us who don't know where they are, where it is, uh, it, it's in Thailand <laughs> still. And it's a little northern uh, uh, corner of, of the country, the, um, the red uh, colored the, province there that is uh, on just in the same latitude as Chiang Mai. Mm -hmm. And um, it wasn't like this in the past. This is people, most people don't know this is a very ancient Lanna principality of six, over, over 600 year history. It only came to join Thailand, Kingdom of Thailand as a vassal state 230 years ago in the, in the reign of King Maron I. And later on became the, transformed into a part of the modern administration, uh, one of the seven provinces of Thailand. Uh, a very low ranking uh, 
uh, province uh, in the in the in the ministry inter interior system, uh, by the way. But but that is no longer is going to be the case. Its importance is not in its economy, which is very little to talk about. Its importance is it sits on the biggest headwater forest of this country that distills that that distill and filters forty percent of the water mass that becomes Chaparral River that flows through the Central Plains and, and Bangkok. That is an important ecological issue that is being under attack. I have translated the, uh, the usual the units of area from the, the, Thai, the Thai version but right in two acres for those of us in the international audience can understand. But it's the, it, it's the top, or some, it's one of the biggest province of Thailand by, by, by its size, but very, very poor in, in its economy. And it, it, the, the difficult thing is that 85% of this province has been declared national forest by law, with all kinds of restrictions of what we can do. And it should be that way, because ecologically, it's mountainous, first grade headwater forest that a country should need and should protect. But over the past decade or so, something has happened to this forest. Trying not to put blame on anybody in particular is the failure of the system. The system has failed the country, not any particular person not any particular group of people, not any particular government. We all have failed as a system to preserve this first class national forest. So the green area that you see on this map is supposed to be the national forest by law. Now the next slide will show the brownish areas, which has been certified by satellite pictures that is now become denuded, like the scene you saw in a moment ago in, 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 the, in, a, in, in, in that video clip. So we've lost 20%, 28% of this first grade national forest to around you use encroachment because encroachment seems to denote that you put blames on the people, on the local people, which is not entirely true. I mean, they've been there long before the forest, were the, the area was declared national forest, right? And they have no other way to make a living. So in the past decade, they, the, the way for the uh, capitalism, as, uh, as you may have it, uh, uh, comes, uh, descends upon uh, the non-province and entice the people to grow, you believe, corn. Corn is not grown on the mountains. Corn is grown on the large fields like Nebraska. But here in Thailand is unique corn, which is low grade, low grade corn for animal feed, is grown on the area of the first grade headwater forest. So we have exchanged first grade national forest, headwater forest, for very low economic value crops like corn. And this didn't happen overnight. It happened over the past 10 years. I tracked, we have tracked the, the statistics from the uh, satellite data, take pictures of the area. So nobody can, can deny that. The pictures uh, tells everything what's that happened. And, and, and plot the graph of how we have uh, increasingly lost this precious natural forest. So this slide here uh, shows the loss in acre per year in a period of uh, three years each over the past 10 years. So altogether, we have lost 28% of this first grade natural forest. But then one wonders, uh, why, why was this allowed to continue this way? Why was no action executed 
by anybody, especially for the, by the state, which is actually responsible for preserving uh, the top grade uh, natural forest like, like, like non-forest here. Uh, what they did, they did. They did try to do things, but it never worked. Because never got out the old concept. They would have never tried to figure out what is the real problem with what is the real cause of this destruction. So they all come up with all same, the same kind of answer. Reforestation, now we're gonna get strict. How can you get strict uh, with the people who are already uh, inhabited this place? Uh, I remember well the um, uh, a quotation, uh, definition uh, from Dr. Albert Einstein said the very definition of stupidity is that people get up and do things exactly the same way like yesterday and expect the results to be different. That is stupidity that we have suffered over the past 10 years. We talk the old, old, old kind of analysis, which, which is not the case. It's not an encroachment. It's a failure of the system to sustain the people. They're not making any meaningful livelihood. And, and when they fail, then they, they have to rely on whatever is at hand. They happen to be living in the national forest. So they cut down the trees to accommodate some demands from somewhere in the world for animal feeds. But along the way, we traded away something that's much more, much more valuable, much more valuable than the, than the, than the, the animal feeds that they make out of the corn. Right? So, I know that in this, during this conference, uh, you hear about fabulous future that Thailand has, spectacular plans and all that. All the strings that Thailand is supposed to have. Yeah. I tell you all the weaknesses. We're stuck. <laughs> We're paralyzed. The state is paralyzed. The people are paralyzed. Nobody can do anything, right? We've lost 28% of first grade national forests. And they're still sitting around and talking how we should re go do reforestation. It's not that simple. People don't have any way to get out of the poverty. You know, we're talking 4.5, GDP, all this very optimistic uh, projection. That's probably true for at least a portion of the, uh, of the Thai population. Not for these people in Nam. They're stuck way under with no hope. Not a single crop, according to my analysis, that's currently being grown in Nam, be it corn or, or bananas or, or lam yai or other things. None of this is valuable enough to sustain life. And we can't sustain the life of the people. The people and the state together can never sustain the life of the forest. And that is the truth. Now, where do I bring this truth to, to be meaningful? I can talk to you people here, and I've talked, give this, given this kind of talk over the past two or three years uh, uh, to whoever who is willing to listen to me. But we have to go to the, uh, the power that runs the country. So I went to the prime minister two years ago, almost. I said, come, 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 come have lunch with me, like, tonight, like today. Right? Come have lunch to, uh, with, me, uh, uh, with me in my house in Nan, and I will give you an analysis of why we end up in this position in Nan Forest. So he did, accept my invitation. Almost two years ago, uh, grumpy looking, as he's always been, <laughs> right? But he did accept my invitation. We believe that for the 80 years that Nan became a part of the Thai provincial system, this is the first time ever that a sitting prime minister of Thailand comes on location to do government work. You believe this. So he did come. And we had lunch. And over that lunch, I made my pitch. Kun Pakon said, I have 30 minutes to give my talk. 
I did my pitch to the prime minister in 15 minutes <laughs> because it was under tight, 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 tight time. Limit. And, and, and you can see, and you can see he was trying to figure out whether he should believe me or not. <laughs> <laughs> So he said, there's no way you're going to arrest all these people who already inhabited this area, which is national forest, and already cut down the trees. If you go by law, everybody should be arrested. They're all illegal. But that's not the way to go. Not here in Thailand anyway. Right? There has to be a better way. And I, I, again, I, I, I want to give you a quote of uh, Dr. Albert Einstein. Things should be as simple as possible, but not simpler. Because the things are too complicated, too complicatedly expressed, it's difficult to explain to people what we want to do. You do it in the simplest form possible, but not simpler than that. Because anything simpler than that is not enough to solve the problem. So I told the Prime Minister, if you look at the national for non-national forest 100%, at the moment, we have lost 28. There's only 72% of the area that is, that is uh, still big trees that, with deep roots that hold on to the water, hold on to the, the, the topsoil, uh, and, and do the, 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 the work that a national forest should do. We've lost 28%. How do we get out of this? Since you're not going to be able to arrest all these people, tens of thousands of poor farmers. We have to find a way to entice them. Entice them to do what? Entice them to, to allow some trees to be grown back. And that I proposed, that we try to negotiate with all the farmers of non province that are the 20%, 28% that they have already cut down trees, they allow 18% of that to be grown back into national forests. But they can still stay there legally, not personally owning, but has the legal right to work in the forest. In the yellow zone, which is 18%, which is going to be grown back, all trees that a national forest should have, and also the 10% that is, is, is also allowed as a, an uh, agricultural area. You don't have to grow back the trees. So 28% is all illegal anyway. So all this has to be given a legal right so the people can stay where they are. But meeting halfway with the state, so that we allow 18% of that 28%, 18% this point of that 20%, to be grown back into trees. So in that case, we will have recoup, if that were to be the case, we will have recoup the, the lost national forest, which we should do, from 72% back to 90%. And he said, I just cooked up these numbers. Do you agree, Prime Minister? And sort of, the body language, sort of agree in that sense. It's not a complication. The politics around the prime minister is incredible. People can get things in him to do anything, right? Anyway, around that luncheon table, there are also five, six other ministers uh, who are actually involved in this kind of thing. But that, again, is not enough. You need to make sure that the people, the farmers, find a new way of making a living, a new kind of agriculture. And, and the current crops they're growing is too low of economic value which they're not going to grow even uh, the whole year round because there's no, there's no, there's no irrigation. Right? Water comes down, it flows away down the mountain. And there's no reservoirs. Why do no reservoirs? Because it's all illegal. You cannot dig any ponds, any reservoir on a national forest. There's all kinds of restrictions that actually uh, cripples the entire effort to try to save the national forest which luckily over the past two years, the law has been relaxed to the point that uh, this kind of agreement can be, can be reached now. Now that agreement on the allocation of land rights is one thing, but making a living, it has to be 
reform in a big way. We have to find a new kind of crops that can grow under big forests, the big trees in the forest. And we have to find a way of making a good quality kind of production and a way of selling that at a reasonable farm price, not the market price at the end of the uh, grocery stores. The farm price is high enough so that the net income for the farmers is high enough for them to live on, which is not the case today. It is far from being the case today. They are overwhelmed with debt, which they will never ever be able to pay back. So that is the exercise that we also have to go through after the allocation of land rights. And that's, that's easier to say. This is as simple as it can be. This, nothing can be simpler than this. Unless you get all these numbers right, we're gonna be, you're not going to gain back this forest. You're not going to gain back the livelihood of the farmers, which go together. Right? After that 15-minute pitch, almost two years ago, it took um, over a year for him to decide the government to decide. And they decide in the most dramatic way of going about solving this problem. It is in itself an innovation in, in the way the state treats a very, uh, very sticky kind of problem that they set up non case as a sandbox, and box being an experiment area. Right? So we're going to treat this as an experiment area, how we go about uh, fixing these problems. And a body like this, right? A new approach for rationalization and utilization of land use in non province The Policy Oversight Committee, I don't list out the names here, but, but it's the Prime Minister who chairs that committee, along with five, six other ministers who are concerned have to do with the national, uh, national forest. But the interesting thing is this is operating committee. For the first time, this is a quasi, a, a, a public private task force to tackle non-forest problem, co-chair by the deputy, uh, by the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Natural Resources, a high-ranking officer of that ministry in charge of the forest, and by me, a private citizen. Is it a very courageous tacit admission that the state officials alone are at the end of their wits of how to go about this? Because it's not, it's not an issue of a national uh, of forestry. It has to do with uh, how we go about making the people uh, able enough to make, to, to make a living so that they can sustain themselves and can stay in the national forest. So that has been um, decreed, and we have been working over the past year already first is to negotiate. The, it's me who's done, who's done most of the negotiation, uh, by the way. So go down to all the 99 districts of uh, non-province, uh, negotiate with the, with the farmers that you come meet the state halfway. We will, the state will, I'm just saying that because I haven't got the green light from the state yet, I'm just saying that. I will go to the state go to the government and said, if you allow 18% to be grown back to big trees, the state will grant you the land rights. Not land rights, the right to stay on the land. It's just still natural forest. There's not gonna be a personal land deeds for anybody. Right. Grant you the right to stay on the land as you are now and, uh, and you can work. And we'll, try, we'll find another way of making a living. You know, grow corn or any other kind of the low low economic value kind of crops. Right. So 80%, 18% and 10%, you become completely legal for the first time in your life. The entire farming uh, uh, population of none. But you have to allow that 80% to be, to be grown back to national forest. We will make sure that you don't starve, that kind of thing. So that's the pitch I made, in, actually on thin air, because I don't have no state authority. Now I'm at a point of about to go back to the government, all the way up to the prime minister, to say that the, the, the people of Nan have come all the way here to 
meet the government halfway? Will you go meet him halfway? Will you allow the entire 28% to be legal in terms of uh, being able to stay there and work? And they will give back 18% to go back. That is the proposition at hand. So that is something that's still, uh, still going on here that I have, I have to make my pitch. And even that were to be the case, we still have to find a way to make NAN a more economically productive area. Otherwise, we will lose all this agreement anyway. So that's, that's in, in a nutshell, that is the NAN sandbox project, which is unique in the way uh, we, uh, the state and the people will try to approach a very sticky problem that's been plaguing uh, us for over the past 10 years. Hopefully that if that were to be, this case were to work out well, it will be a model for the other areas of similar kind of problems. But no other areas, other forest area in Thailand is the case and the mathematics as difficult as Nan province. The mathematics of Nan province, 85% of the land is national, mountainous national terrain is a very difficult one to make a living on. So the, um, uh, I will try to make the, uh, the next move of going back to the, uh, I already talked to some ministers already with, uh, with agreement, but uh, in, in the end it's the prime minister who will make the call or whether they will sign an agreement with the province. As a parting note, I just want to say that the hosts have arranged for me after lunch to uh, give an interview to uh, Bloomberg. Bloomberg was kind enough to send me uh, uh, questions ahead of, hand, ahead of time, several of them. And the last question on that, on that list is that, what is the latest on succession at Kasigon Bank? To give you a preview of my answer, I've, I've, over the past several years, I've gradually managed to relinquish you know, the day-to-day -day operating work. I might having to be involved in the day-to-day -day operating decisions to a very, very capable top management team. So, uh, but I'm still fully accountable. <laughs> so I tell my team that uh, Try not to break the bank. <laughs> and if you have, if that would happen, you come fetch me in the forest. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> and now we are reaching the period that if anyone has a question, please feel free to use a microphone and ask a question. Please state your name and your. Uh, um, entity, and we will um, ask Kun Bantun to answer your question, please. I think since um, it's a quite a Leisure time for us during the lunch. We don't have much uh, energy to think at the moment, <laughs> right? Let me thank you, Kun Bantun, very much for the speech. And I believe that everyone who listened to the non sandbox model learned something new. SET has been very uh, active in promoting the CG and the ESG practices in our listed company because we believe that. There is no other way to achieve a sustainable growth in the company performance except to doing business, considering ESG in the strategy and practices. And also today, the collaboration between the public and private would certainly will enhance uh, the development of the, 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 the company and the, the society. And Kun Bantun example here confirm and stress on our belief. To appreciate Kun Bantun's story, I would like to ask all of us to give a big round of applause to Kumbantun on uh, one more time, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, this is the advertising part. Please be informed that this 
afternoon session will start again at the ballroom from 1.30 p.m. onward. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you. ไม่คืนน่ะเพราะมันไม่มีกินมันไม่ใช่คืนหรอกอ่าอันนั้นคือความพยายามที่จะตอนนี้รั้งเอาไว้บอกว่าขอขอทีอย่าไปฝึกม